Hello and welcome to a very, very cold day here at the Science Shack. Uh, this is the fourth lesson in the evolution topic and we're talking specifically today about how evolution applies to uh, antibiotic resistance. So following on from all the stuff about extinction and fossils, we're going to talk about evolution in a bit more detail that you can actually watch happening and obviously has a serious impact on our health okay so we'll call I'm called this evolution in overdrive because of the speed at which these little critters can evolve okay so if you know the process of natural selection and you know uh, all of the stuff that we've got that's gone before the, the, the principles are exactly the same we're just in a medical context okay so this is the uh, specification as you can see look bacteria can evolve rapidly because they reproduce at a fast rate so on and so forth and the most famous one MRSA Okay, MRSA. Uh, and the idea of what we can actually do as a thing to try and make sure we've got new antibiotics, new antimicrobials to fight the bacteria, and also make the most of the ones that we have. Okay, so we had this in the last lesson the reasons for extinction. Uh, so, over 98% of all the organisms, over 99% of all the organisms that have ever existed on this uh, planet are now extinct. Only that last sort of most recent few. Are alive and these are all the different reasons of course now we're going to focus in on this one here new diseases caused by microorganisms driving a species to the point of extinction okay and I'll always like this theory now, this is a theory in, in evolutionary genetics that comes from the book Alice in Wonderland and you might remember the scene uh, with the Queen of Hearts or the Red Queen where she says this lad they're running on a treadmill and not going anywhere and she says this line now here you see it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And I think that has an awful lot of resonance right, with this evolutionary biology. You've got to keep changing, keep evolving, keep moving forwards or else you're going to be overtaken. Okay, Just to maintain your position as a living existing creature, living existing organism, you have to keep inventing new things and keep moving forward. And that's as true for us as it is for bacteria and viruses and everything else. So. Here is uh, a little review. Now, this obviously links very well back to the GCSE playlist on uh, microbiology, on pathogens and disease. I'll put a link in the description to that. Um, so you should already know what antibiotics are used for and what they work against and what they don't. Okay. So just as a quick recap, antibiotics treat exclusively bacterial disease. They do not work against anything else. Okay. So they work in a variety of different ways, and broadly speaking, what they do is they are chemicals that bind to, attack, or destroy bits of bacterial cells that you don't have. For example, the most famous one would be penicillin, and penicillin attacks the cell wall. Now, your cells don't have cell walls, so you can put this drug that attacks bacterial cell walls into you. It's going to do nothing to your cells because... You don't have any cell walls but it's going to prevent the formation of a cell wall on a bacteria and that bacteria will then pop okay so bacterial cell walls destroyed due to osmosis water floods in and the bacterial cell pops it's probably the most famous uh, antibiotic that there is but there's loads and loads of other ones um, that attack the ribosomes now you should know what a ribosome is bacterial ribosomes are a slightly different shape they're a little bit smaller than ours so if you put a drug in that can attack them then of course that's going to inhibit the bacteria's ability to manufacture protein to kill it but not you so things like tetracycline are in that one okay you can attack different proteins in the membranes you can attack their methods of dna synthesis rna synthesis all those different areas so basically if a bacteria has got it and you don't it's a target for anti uh, for antibiotics now of course you should be able to see from these mechanisms of action they do not work against viruses. They cannot work against viruses because a virus isn't alive in the first place. Okay, the virus doesn't have the same structure. It's inside your own. When they infect you, they're inside your own cells. So how's the, the how's the uh, antibiotic going to get there? And they simply do not work against viruses. It is a completely different thing. Okay. Now, of course, we have invented a lot of those antibiotics. And we got very excited okay so uh, antibiotics only became fairly routine use uh, after the end of the second world war so we're talking late 40s early 50s obviously alexander fleming uh, how walter flory uh, were involved in the discovery of penicillin but the sort of mass use sort of came in around the 50s time so there were wonderful adverts and i always return to this picture here look uh, penicillin cures gonorrhea in four hours see your doctor today 
Okay, obviously that was a big need, obviously, in that part of America, wherever it was. I also particularly like this. He now has penicillin, because your doctor could possibly be a lady. No, 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 he has penicillin. Um, so that, that kind of advert just sort of illustrates the kind of excitement and the explosion of treatments using uh, antibiotics that we've had since the 1950s. Okay, the, the sort of 50s through to the 70s was sort of the golden age of antibiotic discovery. There seemed to be a new antibiotic popping up every every second day, uh, loads of them out there, and everyone thought, brilliant, we have won against bacteria. Okay, that we've defeated them forever. But they forgot their evolutionary theory. Okay, so there's a little content warning here. If you are squeamish in any way, I'm going to show you some medical images of the consequences of not having effective antibiotics. So please do look away if you are squeamish in any way. So I'm going to show you what happens if you've got an infection that you can't treat with antibiotics. Of course, so this is post-surgical. We would routinely give antibiotics. If someone's injured, we routinely give antibiotics because the one we're probably most worried about at the moment now is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, okay? Which is a normal skin bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, normal skin bacteria, every single person's got it. But if you get cut either through surgery or through injury, right, and that bacteria gets in, well, you usually just treat that with a bit of antibiotics, no problem. But if the antibiotic doesn't work, that bacteria can get in and cause all sorts of swelling and cause a death of tissues, what's called necrotic tissue, and the black, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to very quickly show you what happens when the uh, when the antibiotics fight back. Okay, so what have antibiotics done for us? Well, they've prevented uh, nail bed infections like this. Okay, that would normally be treatable with an antibiotic, and of course, uh, post-operative infections that look like that of somebody's leg there that has obviously uh, suffered from major uh, incision, and you've got an infection in there that's causing swelling. Okay, so that's that's gone now. That's done. But just to show you how important those are. Now, of course, for a lot of those people, you could think, well, if the antibiotics don't work in a medical setting, what's the option? Well, really, we're back to amputation. Okay, which is why I show you those illustrative photos. Okay, so it's very, very serious. All right, it's a very, very serious um, problem. And if the bacteria get into your blood and move around your body, that's called septicemia. Right, and that can be fatal in very, very short order. In fact, you might have seen the adverts about spotting the signs of sepsis, sepsemia on the uh, on the outside of ambulances at the moment because we're very worried about that. Okay, uh, so how do they form? Right? What what is it? Well, it's basically just a function of the evolution that you already know. Right. So, in terms of antibiotic resistant bacteria in a population of bacteria, there'll be some that have mutations that make them more resistant to antibiotics than others. So maybe. They have a slightly different shaped cell wall that penicillin can't bind to. They've got slightly different shaped ribosomes that our tetracycline can't bind to. Whatever it might be, right, when others don't. That's variation, okay? And the reason this variation pops up is bacteria produce, reproduce really fast and really sloppily, okay? So there's mutations that come along really quickly and really often, okay? And if a mutation kills one of them, well, it doesn't matter, it doesn't. That doesn't affect any of the others, so they just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. So a generation time for us might be 20 years or 30 years. For them, it's about 20 minutes. Okay, this is why they evolve so quickly and why they mutate so quickly. Okay, so uh, I do recommend, and I'm going to put the link again in the description, having a look at this Stanford Medical um, video here, showing just how quickly bacteria can evolve and move into higher and higher and higher and higher con concentrations. Of antibiotics it's an absolutely staggering video okay so let's go on to the actual mechanism of how they form and you could be asked to write a step-by-step -step of how antibiotic resistant bacteria have formed via natural selection evolution so here's a colony of bacteria maybe it's causing you some trouble maybe it's not you've got bacteria in you on you all over you and they're a normal part of your healthy interaction with your environment okay and within that population as we know there's some variation Okay, so those three ones are the slightly more resistant bacteria. Maybe they've got a, uh, a slightly different shaped cell wall. Maybe they've got slightly different shaped ribosomes. We don't know. Normally, in that population, unless we change the environment, they're probably just going to die out. They're going to be outcompeted by the blue ones, by the normal ones. Okay, so if you put in a decent dose of antibiotic, you'll probably kill them all. Okay, if you take the antibiotic prescribed by the doctor in the dose prescribed, for the duration of the time described, you'll probably wipe them all out. That's fine, even, even the slightly resistant ones. 
problem comes if we go back to this scenario again if we get a bit lazy if we take antibiotics for all sorts of stuff that we don't really need to we take a few we feel a bit better we stop taking them maybe we don't finish the course maybe we give oh i've got some in the drawer from last time maybe oh you can have a few of those that kind of thing okay then you're putting regular doses regular low level doses of antibiotics into the bacteria's environment and of course that's the scenario where the most resistant ones survive Okay, maybe you kill a few of the resistant ones, but if even one of those resistant ones can survive, well now it's got no competition. So what's it going to do? Well, of course, it's going to reproduce. Okay, and multiply this effect by lots and lots and lots and lots of generations each time, killing off right, killing off those weaker ones and leaving the stronger ones. Basically, you are forcing natural selection by changing the bacteria's environment. Okay. Eventually, when you put a proper dose in and you take it for the full amount of time, it doesn't go anywhere. Nothing happens. Okay. And you put in a massive dose for huge amounts of time. Eventually, what you've got is a completely resistant strain of that particular bacteria, and that is extremely dangerous. Your options then, of course, are change antibiotic. Maybe they're sensitive to another antibiotic. See your year nine. Uh, lessons on microbes and disease for, for information on that or that's a very bad consequence for the patient because either their immune system deals with it or it doesn't okay? and it's very very serious so obviously keeping on doing this this leads to natural selection this is evolution okay and anybody who says that it isn't well isn't paying attention okay this is an it's not just like evolution it is evolution it's evolution you can watch happening in a petri dish okay so that's why it's in this topic so to put that in words for you right again so let's say we've got a colony of bacteria there up at the top we add antibiotic a maybe five, 95 percent of the kill maybe we don't add quite enough to kill that last five percent well those mutants are going to survive why are those mutants there question in green well mutations happen spontaneously uh, due to dna uh, due to dna copying some mutagens like radiation, UV, um, they're obviously going to be greater in bacteria because the speed at which they reproduce compared to us. The ones with the, the mutation survive. Then, of course, you might add antibiotic B, same thing happens, antibiotic C, and on and on and on and on. Obviously, non-resistant ones die, resistant ones survive. Obviously, once you do kill off most of the population, why can they now? Why can the other ones now reproduce? Well, less competition for food, space, resource. They've got a what we call a selective advantage, a natural selection advantage. Uh, these can then spread to other other people under normal circumstances, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, resistance to multiple antibiotics develops over lots of generations. Now, you can think of this on petri dishes, but if you think about it from the bacteria's point of view. There, there's a wonderful place for this to happen, for bacteria to move around from very nice incubators one to the other, uh, get experience or training against lots of different antibiotics, and it's because of something we do. So we take people who are maybe a little bit immune suppressed and we pack them into the buildings on their own, right, special buildings, okay, we put them all next to each other, we might be treating them all with different antibiotics, and we have staff going round and round and round moving the bacteria accidentally from one patient to another of course i'm talking about hospitals so before this was fully understood the threat of antibiotic resistance bacteria is fully understood hospitals basically were the the best petri dishes for antibiotic resistance and, and the way you defeat this well you go back to the old school cleaning scrubbing yeah disinfecting absolutely everything and it's been particularly relevant during this particular pandemic Okay, so in uh, in total, right? This is sort of our flow diagram of what happens. You get a colony of bacteria treated with antibiotic A, five percent survive through a particular mutation. The surviving bacteria form a new colony resistant to antibiotic A, so you switch to antibiotic B. Same thing happens. Repeat, 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 repeat. Eventually, you've got a multiple resistant uh, bacteria, and if you get resistance to essentially the last line of antibiotics, uh, which used to be this antibiotic called methicillin. Essentially, what you've got is methicillin resistant, and if it's a skin bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, and that's where the word comes from. Sometimes the M, you can use, you can think of it as multiple resistant, 
Staphylococcus aureus, but technically it stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and it's the uh, the sort of poster child for antibiotic resistant bacteria. Okay, uh, very very serious hospital acquired infection. So, what is it we're doing about it? Surely we should be doing something about this. Well, unfortunately, we're not doing enough. Really, it is a very large threat. Antibi the, the evolution of bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics. It's a very, very big threat. And we're not really doing much about it. Basically, written there, the lack of research due to funding models. Essentially, if you look back at your GCSE drug development stuff, there are huge amounts of candidate um, drugs for all sorts of different things. And then those drugs kind of get whittled down, whittled down through placebo trials and so on and so forth. So that the cost of bringing a drug to market is in the billions of pounds or dollars, okay, if it's a complicated. And if you do that, right, and you're a private drug development company, well, then you want to be able to make that money back, okay? And if you make a really, really, really good antibiotic, like the best possible antibiotic, then your patient's only going to take one pill and be cured, or seven days' worth of pills and be cured. So that's not a really good way to make your money back, right? Um, so what... Uh, pharmaceutical companies are often more interested in doing is making drugs that you have to take for a long period of time. Statins, for example, are a fantastic example. Okay, And they're not particularly incentivized to make very, very effective drugs for uh, very acute, what's called acute uh, illness that basically goes away. Right, And that is a problem of how they're funded because they're privately, uh, privately funded private companies. If you were to do this for the public good, you would do this through public money, okay? You'd fund this uh, development and basically have this backed by nations, backed by governments, backed by, backed by taxation, okay? But that is not the situation we live in. And if you think, well, hang on, making money is the wrong priority here. We're trying to save lives. I agree with you, but that's not the world in which we live, okay? You've also got problems with differing laws in different countries. There are some countries you can go to where you can just buy antibiotics over the over the counter in the, in the pharmacist. Here, you need uh, prescriptions in most cases, although we are actually easing some rules on that. Something like uh, chloramphenicol for conjunctivitis, your pharmacist can diagnose it and give out a bottle of that. So we've got differing laws in different countries, but do you think the bacteria care what country they're in? Not at all, okay? And this is a problem of lack of coordination between governments, okay? The idea being that at the exact moment where this is becoming a really big problem, our government is removing itself from a large block of countries in the area and, and healthcare is one area and infectious disease is one area where international collaboration is massively important so we're not really doing enough to address that even if we do something within britain okay however good news is not all doom and gloom it's mostly doom and gloom this one i'm afraid but uh it's not all doom and gloom uh literally six days ago um, the, there was a, a really good news uh, from Oxford University uh, being funded by the INEOS chemical uh, company to the tune of £100 million to start a, uh, an antibiotic or antimicrobial research uh, facility to come up with either more antibiotics or other ways to control microbial populations. Okay, So that's obviously some good news. So some people are starting to take it seriously, but this is too little and arguably too late. Okay, We need to really be taking this threat seriously. And that's one of the things the pandemic has shown us, even though that's viruses, not bacteria. Okay, There is obviously hope with modern technology, things like, um, for example, uh, there are always new vulnerabilities, new antimicrobials being found. There's a citizen science project you can get involved with, um, looking for novel antimicrobial compounds in nature. Uh, the BBC, for example, had lots of places in there swabbed for one of their science programs, and it turned out a new novel antimicrobial uh, compound was found on a in a bacteria living on the end of the big dialect in their receptions, sort of um, eye slash weapon thing. Okay, so I know those are different things on a dialect, and I would have annoyed the Doctor Who fans, but you know, you get the idea. Nanotechnology using nanoparticles to kill drug resistant bacteria—that's another clever suggestion so people are working on this but it needs to be going far faster and uh you know far faster and, and and with far more funding behind it okay now the other thing that's mentioned on your syllabus and is really important is the use of antibiotics in agriculture now for years 
things like cows, animals like cows, were given antibiotics just routinely, just in their feed. Reason being, they live in a symbiosis with bacteria in their guts, which digest the grass for them and allow them to absorb the nutrients. But that means they're constantly expending energy, sort of trying to suppress and control their own internal bacterial colonies. And the farmers worked out if you could give them antibiotics and did a little bit of that for them, more of that energy would go into growth or milk production and they would get more profits. Now, we don't do that in the UK anymore, right? Uh, and yeah, I believe the European Union may have banned that practice. Um, but, you know, we certainly don't do that in, in this country anymore. Uh, you can use antibiotics for a sick animal. No one would suggest that that is a bad idea. Um, but when you do, for example, in a dairy cow, use antibiotics, it's removed and it's milk for a certain amount of time is not and does not enter into the into the human food chain is not sold so there are very strict quantities of antibiotic and it's tiny tiny parts per million so, uh, of detectable antibiotic in milk that can go into the human food chain uh, in the uk not the case in the usa the usa as we've heard in the news an awful lot has an, uh, an awful lot of different farming practices which is why there's been a lot of stories, as you can see here, um, about American imports. Now we've departed from the European Union, uh, which might mean that we could bring be bringing in uh, hormone-fed beef and chlorinated chicken, as well as lots of agricultural products that have used antibiotics recklessly and therefore contribute to our own problem in terms of resistant microbes. Okay, And that is definitely something that we don't want. Having been to America a number of times. There's a lot of wonderful things about the USA, a lot of things to recommend about America. The food and the agricultural standards are not one of them. Okay, so we really don't want this in, in the UK, I would argue, okay, from a biological perspective. Right, so that is one thing definitely we can do. So let's, let's try and be a little bit positive here, because I know this is all very doom and gloom, but in terms of sensible actions that we can be taking on a government level, on a medical profession level, and on an individual level, right? Well, the government level, we certainly need to maintain an, out, uh, an outlaw, the routine use of antibiotics in agriculture, okay? That is a fairly sensible action. It's something we have in the UK. Uh, field tripper took one to a Welsh farm at one point, and I'm going to do the accent, I'm going to warn you. So, you know, sorry anyone listening who is a native. Um, basically, we got a tour round uh, with some students and the farmer was a dairy farmer, and he was talking about this use of antibiotics, and that if he has to treat um, the udder uh, for mastitis, uh, for blocked uh, milk uh, teat, that kind of stuff, he would treat that with antibiotics, but then that cow would have to be milked separately so that the milk didn't enter his big vat of milk that could then be sent, uh, sold to Marks and Spencers, which basically everywhere from the north of Wales right the way over to Liverpool, most of central Wales was supplied from this man's farm. Uh, and one of my students put the hand up and said, well, if his got antibiotics in it why do you have to milk it at all and he looked at this child incredulous and went because it's a cow in it got to milk it or it'll die right so even if you do milk the cow there you can't put that into uh into the food chain now that is very sensible we don't want animals suffering so we do use antibiotics to treat them in the veterinary medicine but not in the human food chain okay no i'm not routinely so that obviously works really well if you do it in a country but it works even better if you have international collaboration because of course if you ban this it's going to take a it's going to take a hit on the you're going to uh, on the farmer's food right so they're going to produce better quality food that's better for you but they're going to produce less of it okay and if you've got one country here doing this which is good and another country here next door without those laws who can import into your country then you've got unfair competition arguably so we need international collaboration, okay? We need, oh, I don't know, let's say a continent, right, to do this together without countries sort of, you know, removing themselves from the equation and putting up walls, okay? So we need to do that with international collaboration, okay? We've also got on a medical professional level, and again, these are lines taken directly from your syllabus, we need to have very strict prescribing rules. Time was, you could go to the doctor and say, oh, I feel a bit under the well or under the weather. I think I've got the flu. Oh, can you give me something? And the doctors would just go, "Hey, I'll have antibiotics and, and go away," because it would be a placebo, right? Really, what you need is bed rest. But but patients don't like that when you when they're just told to go away and rest and have fluids. They like to be given something. You know, that's the placebo effect. So for a long time, antibiotics were that under the argument of preventing secondary infections. 
Right? However, that has now been knocked on the head. Um, doctors are very good at that, certainly in this country, at being very, well, why, do you, what makes you think it's an antibiotic? What makes you think it's bacterial? Let's take a swab, let's grow it on a plate, let's find out. That's very sensible. So that's an action that we need to take. And an individual accent, that action you can take, if you have, so obviously that clearly needs international collaboration. If you can just uh, go over to Spain, or those were the days, um, then and buy antibiotics over the counter then you're developing a antibiotic resistance pool of bacteria in one country spain was an example and then just bringing that back in and on you to other countries in the, in the neighboring areas okay we just look at how fast covid spread to give an example of that and on your case now i don't mean like the picture i just like this picture patients must finish the course if your doctor does decide to give you antibiotics for anything and says yeah you do need a course of antibiotics i'm choosing this antibiotic and you take it this regularly for this amount of time and not do this you do it because the reason will be antibiotic resistance the likelihood is you'll feel better the symptoms will go after a few hours as the, as the bulk of those bacteria that are causing the problem get brought under control but the last bacteria you kill are always the most resistant ones. So you must finish your course if your doctor has decided to add, uh, to give you antibiotics. Okay, so that is antibiotic resistance and evolution. Sorry, it's a bit of a doom and gloom one, folks, but that is covering the uh, covering the syllabus. I hope that made sense. And we are now racing towards the end of the evolution uh, chapter, as it is for GCSE biology. I do hope that makes sense. And if you want to go back and look at your uh, pathogens and microbes, uh, then have a look at the link in the description. Thanks very much.